This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was one of the most complex and long-lasting chapters of tension between two countries in all of human history. From the time World War II ended until the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, both nations held worldwide nuclear devastation in their hands. While the two vaguely fought for the same side to defeat Germany and the other Axis powers in the Second World War, very soon after, the struggle to lead the world politically became a source of contention. Russia and America started to obsess over learning each other's secrets. They started wars against each other secretly with other neighboring countries, and they even infiltrated some of the most clandestine intelligence organizations known to man. John Anthony Walker was a United States naval officer enlisting in 1955 and serving in what most thought was a faithful capacity until 1985 when it was revealed that he was part of aspiring for the Soviet Union for close to 20 years. The level of sensitive information he gave away to what the world considered America's enemies was incredibly detailed and wide-ranging, especially in regard to submarine capabilities and locations, which was something Walker specialized in. During the investigation, it was found that the spy ring he was involved with was operating at a high enough level to literally change the balance of power between the US and the Soviet Union, and even his own son was involved in the espionage. Let's look today at the story of John Anthony Walker and how he got lured by temptation of power, even when it meant betraying his own country. John Anthony Walker was born on July 28, 1937, to an Italian-American mother and a father who was a film marketer for Warner Brothers. As a middle child, he was raised for a time in Washington, D.C., spending his time as an altar boy in the local Catholic church, but the family soon moved to Scranton, Pennsylvania, after his alcoholic father went bankrupt and lost his job. The small Pennsylvania town was near John's grandparents, and while there, he took on a paper route, ushered at a local movie theater, and, and hawked home products door to door. His business acumen enabled him to purchase his own car at the age of 16. Two years later, John Anthony Walker made the fateful decision to join the Navy. This was not a completely voluntary decision, however. Walker had recently dropped out of high school, and he and a friend had undertaken a slew of burglaries on May 27, 1955. Their total haul amounted to a few tires, some automobile accessories, and a little bit of cash, but it was enough to get him in the kind of trouble that ended with a police chase and his eventual arrest. His choice? Well, enlist or face jail time. He signed up and became a radio operator, serving on a destroyer escort and then transferring to a full-time crew member aboard the USS Forrestal. This was no small feat, as the Forrestal was the first American supercarrier and considered the finest in its class. In 1957, Walker was on shore leave near Boston when he met Barbara Crowley at a dance, who would very soon become his wife. Within the next three years, they would have three daughters. Walker went off to qualify at submarine school, rising even higher in the ranks, but at home, things were less than perfect. He was already resenting having married Barbara and sometimes referred to his daughters as bitches. He chose to hang out with his shipmates over spending time as a husband and a father at home. Barbara was desperate to keep him and had another child, this time a boy. John was away at a baseball game instead of with Barbara at the hospital, so she named him Michael instead of John Walker III, as his father wanted. Still, John progressed in his career. As the U.S. submarine fleet was modernizing in an astounding way, he was given more and more responsibility. Walker was given top-level cryptographic clearance and passed stringent mental health tests that assured he was capable of being being trusted with nuclear weapons. His submarine missions took him far and wide, from surveillance missions near Russia to nuclear bomb test observations. He was then assigned to the USS Andrew Jackson, a high-powered, top-of-the-line nuclear submarine in Charleston, South Carolina. The sub was capable of hitting targets almost 3,000 miles away, something the Navy was very proud to admit, and that's when Walker was granted access to a top-secret report that showed every nuclear target the United States was considering. Almost immediately, John Anthony Walker began to wonder just how much he could gain from sharing this information with America's enemies.
While in South Carolina, Walker attempted to live a fantasy life of luxury. He opened a bar, which he was sure would be a hit with all of his Navy buddies, whom he was still carousing around with instead of living a more domestic life. He was developing an alcohol problem, much like his father had in the past, and running a bar was exactly what he didn't need. He was able to get the place started with the financial help of his brother Arthur, who was also stationed in Charleston and who was also in the Navy. Almost instantly, he began hemorrhaging money. He started taking his troubles out on his wife even more and having affairs with other women. Barbara, feeling the weight of his distant coldness, initiated an affair of her own with Arthur, who had a marriage of his own. This dalliance would allegedly go on for over a decade, with John being none the wiser that his own brother was betraying him. The Navy would call upon John to report to one of its prized fleets in Norfolk, Virginia, and it would turn out to be yet another major wall placed between him and his wife. Barbara decided that she could stay in Charleston with the children and help manage the bar. They made a deal that if the bar wasn't turned a profit within a year, they would sell it. Walker's promotion to Norfolk and rank promotion to chief warrant officer allowed him a peek into a whole new level of sensitive information. It was also around this time that his demeanor towards the Soviet Union cooled quite a bit. He began to think that the country was not as insidious and fearful as his fellow Americans believe. The assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963 cemented these views for him. He believed it to be the work of the government to continue to inspire fear in its people. Walker said, The farce of the Cold War and the absurd war machine it spawned was an ever-growing pathetic joke to me. He eventually took the fateful step that would define the rest of his life at this time. He stole a classified document. In October of 1967, Walker first took advantage of his top-level position at the Atlantic Fleet Submarine Headquarters to copy an important document. This classified information revealed a key list for cracking codes that the U.S. Navy used to scramble its radio transmissions. With this information, the Soviets could learn submarine positions well in advance and all sorts of other devastatingly crucial information. Once he stole a copy of the document, he traveled north to D.C., where he made a stop at the Soviet Embassy. He met with security specialist Yakov Lukasevitz who was understandably confused at this naval officer who stood before him, offering to give up a government secret in exchange for compensation. Yakov was leery, but contacted a KGB friend of his, Boris Solomatin, to verify that the information was indeed legitimate. They were both concerned that it was just too serendipitous that someone would come to them with a winning lottery ticket. It was too easy. No one comes into a rival embassy stating that they have national secrets that they want to give to the enemy country. Except John Anthony Walker, apparently. And, well, the Soviets listened. The Soviet embassy went off and vetted his document and were quite pleased with what they found it revealed. They told him that they wanted more. Much more. They asked what he expected in return. Walker said he just wanted money. The embassy and KGB agents grilled him further to see how committed and entrenched in the surveillance world he was. They wanted to know his marital status and if he had a history with drugs and alcohol. The questions about alcohol may have gotten him riled up or hit home too much, as he quickly fired back with an offer to work for the Soviets for the rest of his life. Walker's requests for financial compensation were a little different than the Soviets were accustomed to, however. What he was asking for was basically a steady paycheck, and since the information he had access to was of such importance, they acquiesced. Walker threw out a figure of $1,000 a week, and they actually agreed to it. They forged a deal where they would give Walker a list of code keys they desired, and he would steal them. Then a veritable spy movie scene would take place where Walker would have a folded magazine cover under one arm while parked outside a strip mall. A man approached him and gave him instructions on how to hand off the valuable intel. Once the handoff took place, he was handed an envelope stuffed with money and then ushered off by an unknown man before being dumped in a nondescript residential neighborhood miles away. John Anthony Walker was now making money as a bona fide Soviet spy. Now, I promise this is not a good way for you to make money, but maybe starting a business is, and that brings me to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, a couple of simple things. Maybe you've got an idea for a business, and you want to see if it's going to work in the world. Well, two, the only way to know if it's going to work is to get it out there, and the best way to do that is with a website, and that's where Squarespace comes in. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something online? Yes, it's easy to set up a store with Squarespace. Squarespace. Want to start a podcast? Starting a YouTube channel? Well, podcasts, of course, they handle all of that stuff. And if you've got a YouTube channel, you're going to want a website to complement it. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content. Or you can start from scratch, or you can easily move over from an existing domain, making everything super easy to manage. Don't start from scratch, though. Just use a template. 
no excuses. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there are no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all of the website-y stuff, like I say, podcasts, oh yes, but also mailing lists, social integrations, and much more. Plus 24-hour customer support, just in case you get confused, but you probably won't, it's really easy. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, and let's get back to it. While the Soviets now had a working relationship with Walker, they still were incredibly careful to make sure their prized cow continued producing results. They had KGB agents and former Soviet general Oleg Kaligin assigned to keep track of Walker. Kaligin was the man responsible for scoping out the best areas around Washington, D.C. Once he scouted an area, Walker would arrive and cash and intelligence would be traded and literal countries would inch even closer to nuclear conflict. Case in point, one such handoff of sensitive military information in 1968 resulted in the USS Pueblo spy ship being captured by North Korea. The American naval ship was then raided and the contents sent to Moscow. The Russians were now deep in American armed services territory, and most of it was thanks to John Anthony Walker. Walker, whether he knew all of the direct consequences of his actions or not, was living the high life. He moved Barbara and his four kids into a magnificent housing complex in Norfolk and was spending lavishly, despite Russian warnings not to raise suspicions. He hired someone to manage his bar back in Charleston that Barbara had been looking after. The state of that business was still dire, and the place was losing money faster than anyone had anticipated, but that was just a blip on Walker's radar. He was simply making too much money to care or notice. He bought a luxurious sports car and a huge boat, and was shacking up with young college girls on weekends, even sailing his boat to the Caribbean islands. Barbara was shocked, however, when she was going through John's things one night, and found some rather clandestine in photographs and written instructions from the hands of KGB agents. She sat her husband down when he got home and demanded to know what he had gotten involved in. Surprisingly, he told her. More surprisingly, she was intrigued. After all, he was now pulling off acts of worldwide espionage that exposed new amazing nuclear submarine technology and changed the way troops hit the ground in Vietnam. Barbara talked her way into joining John on his next intel drop. She credited the slow and painful decline of their marriage to making such a risky decision and thought somewhere deep down that if she tried to enjoy a little bit of the spy life too, maybe it would rekindle things for the couple. And it might have for a time. John would be behind the wheel of the car and the two would head off to the drop-off site with Barbara ready to jump out and make the swap. Barbara would even iron the wrinkled wadded cash when they got home. They used an array of tiny cameras and all the intel they provided to the Soviets had to fit inside of a soda can. But the KGB had warned John from the beginning not to divulge anything, especially with his family. It would always come back to haunt him. Around 1969, John began being pulled to the West Coast, as more and better work was opening up for him in San Diego. He was to become a mentor of sorts, teaching new radio operators, but that didn't stop him from his thieving, traitorous ways. Since he didn't have the same kind of top-level access that he did back east, he had to rely on a library of classified information to pull from, which was riskier and more laborious. But he made it work. He was becoming a seasoned, deft criminal. He even forged his own security clearance certificate. When he was able to abscond from the San Diego facilities with national secrets, he had a complex web of Marine Guard security checkpoints to navigate. It was getting harder and harder to cheat on his country, and his pay was changed to reflect the lessening intel he was able to steal. But he did have an idea. John befriended a student of his at the radio operator training school named Jerry Whitworth. One night, they went sailing together, and he got talking about the recent movie Easy Rider, and the two began waxing philosophical about making a boatload of money off one big heist. Walker could tell he already had his hooks in Jerry, but he waited for years. John was reassigned somewhere out to sea where he could get away from the family he didn't want. He had renewed security clearance, which the Soviet spies loved. Barbara began hinting that she wanted a divorce, but John charmed her into remaining in the marriage, mostly because she could expose him. So he cut her loose from the spy ring and enlisted Jerry Whitworth. He tantalized him with fantastic amounts of money that he could be making. Whitworth showed some hesitation when Walker finally told him it would involve selling secrets to the Russians, but John calmed him down and 
said they would also be helping some American allies like Israel. Whitworth was the perfect foil, too. He had just graduated from the school Walker taught and was shipping off to work with satellite communications, which was its own treasure trove of secrets waiting to be had. With Jerry taking on so much work, Walker moved back to Norfolk and retired from the Navy. He also finally bid Barbara farewell as the two divorced in 1974. John turned to private detective gigs, but was still very much under the thumb of the Soviet spy ring. Whitworth was conducting the bulk of the espionage, but Walker was still doing the drops. Still, Whitworth was aware of the value he was presenting and began to complain about his lack of compensation. Walker was already thinking of ways to add to the spy ring and began to look to his own family. His own brother, Arthur, joined and began stealing classified documents. John also began to recruit and talk his youngest child, Michael, into a life filled with spy adventures. And as Michael adored his father, he had already decided to join the Navy. John Anthony Walker employed a brilliantly cruel method to talk his son into officially spying against the United States. He brought up one of Michael's favorite movies, The Godfather. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. He spoke fantastically about how Michael could take over the family espionage business, just like his namesake did for the Corleone family. He even showed Michael his social security card, noting that Michael's first three numbers of his card were 007, like James Bond himself. Michael was drunk off the fantasy. Michael was assigned to the USS Nimitz in 1984, a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. During his time there, he was given the responsibility of destroying sensitive classified material. Being John Anthony Walker's child, though, you can guess what he did with that information instead. That's right, he stole them and had his father turn them over to the Russians. He also cracked safe combinations and tried to shake out every single secret that the ship had contained within it. All for his father. Barbara was finding out more and more after the divorce that she simply didn't want to know about. He also wasn't paying alimony, despite being flush with cash. Barbara was not as blessed financially and was actually staying with their son Michael and his new wife. Her anger towards her ex-husband spilled into their house, and Barbara began telling Michael that she might just rat John out to the federal government. John used this to his own advantage, telling Michael that he should tell his mother that he himself was involved in the spy ring. John figured that she would never hurt her own son, even if he was guilty of treason. Of course, John was just trying to protect himself. The thing is, Michael never told his mother about his own involvement. So without that knowledge, Barbara did indeed contact the Boston FBI office, and after much digging, they had enough reason to tap John's phones. Weeks of surveillance ensued, and not a lot was gained. One May Day in 1985, however, while the FBI was secretly camped outside John Anthony Walker's house, they finally hit pay dirt. Walker was inside, putting together a hell of a drop for the KGB with names and locations and everything else they could want inside. When he left to do the handoff, they followed him. After losing him for several hours, they spotted his van. More curiously, nearby, they also observed a sedan with diplomatic plates belonging to a member of the Soviet embassy. The agents pounced on the drop and all the secrets it held. John Anthony Walker was arrested at a nearby hotel. His son was still aboard the USS Nimitz, but he too had his cover blown. He confessed almost immediately. Jerry Whitworth foolishly let agents search his trailer, and they found a computer disk chock full of things that he should not have had in his possession. The whole ring was annihilated. Walker agreed to testify against Whitworth, and in return, Michael was given a more lenient sentence of 25 years and was actually released in the year 2000. The rest of the gang all received life sentences. John Anthony Walker died in prison in 2014, and while the Cold War came and went, he brought the two sides so much closer to all-out war than they should ever have been in the first place. So much for being a true countryman. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this several times a week. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace, linked to below. And thank you for watching.